once again, my name is Jason Gravy. Uh, I want to take a little bit of time here to talk about our spring applied fertilizer study that we did in 2015. Um, we had a couple different purposes for um, this study. Uh, first, we wanted to evaluate yield responses to dry fertilizer applications at planting. Um, I feel as we encounter more regulations, single product applications are going to become more important. Um, as we try to find a balance for spreading some of that all applied fertilizer, that fertilizer applied into December, into the spring, possibly even after planting to break up a workload standpoint from you know, some of these regulations that we're going to have coming down the pipeline. What kind of responses are we seeing from applications made at planting with uh, dry products? Um, with this, we also wanted to fit, measure the effects of micronutrient encapsulated dry products as well. Um, I think we all realize in here there's an increased need for sulfur fertility in corn. Um, does a program like this have a good fit for meeting those sulfur requirements? So once again, if we're making a spring application, one dry fertilizer, does it make sense to look at some of these specialty products that have got micros encapsulated on them? Um, with that, are we going to see a yield response from some of these micro packages? Um, and really the third thing for us is, um, does this provide an economic way to get those micronutrients that we need, um, especially for guys who aren't set up to handle micros now? Um, you know, if you're a guy that's got no starter on his planter, you might be all pre-planned anhydrous. So you're, you've got to find a system to put sulfur and zinc down uh, to fit those needs. You just can't pop it in your 2x2 in your two two on your planter if you don't have that 2x2 two two placement there. So uh, we want to evaluate that it makes sense and, and have a good fit. Plot design. Uh, we used a replicated randomized small block design. Um, same thing we usually do on our, our small block work like this. Four locations, five reps per location. Um, plot sizes were two row 30 inch plots, 20 foot in length. Treatments we evaluated on corn, we had our control in there with no application, um, a MAP treatment, and then Micro Essentials SC, which is a 1240-0 with 10% sulfur and 1% zinc. Um, on the soybean side, we looked at a control, once again, no application, potash treatment, and then Aspire, which is another mosaic product. Um, that's 0058 with half a percent boron. Rates we evaluated on corn, 200 pounds of MAP, 200 pounds of MES. Out of that 200 pounds of MES, you're getting 20 pounds of sulfur and two pounds of zinc. Um, on soybeans with a 200 pound potash rate with 207 pounds of Aspire. Um, basically running a little bit higher Aspire rate to match our total potash um, with that Aspire being no 058 versus uh, red potash. So um, all these applications were made after planting but before emergence. Um, one other note, the reason, the rates that we chose, uh, basically we chose these rates trying to mimic a crop removal rate for a two-year spread. So, uh, you know, roughly a 200-pound map rate on corn, or a head of corn, um, meeting those soybean needs <coughs> last year as well. Here's our four locations, uh, Bradford, Troy, Milford Center, and then down in Washington Courthouse. A little bit on sulfur and zinc fertility basics. Um, sulfur is a secondary nutrient, it's not a micronutrient. Um, carries a negative charge, is mobile in the soil, immobile in plants. Typically influenced by organic matter, poor drainage, and atmospheric deposition of sulfur. Uh, we're just not getting as much free sulfur out of the atmosphere with uh, nosme acid rain events um, taking place now. Um, zinc is a micronutrient, carries a positive charge. It's immobile in both soil and plants. And typical factors um, that influence zinc availability include high pH levels, high phosphorus levels, um, low organic matter levels. Um, since it is a micronutrient, it's important. It's just needed in relatively small quantities in the plant. Um, Basically what we're looking at here is a nutrient utilization um, uptake by grow stage on both sulfur and zinc. I don't have a laser pointer, but uh, basically if we look at that VT to R1 grow stage, we can see that we 
have about 50% of our sulfur needs covered um, through those vegetative stage till we basically hit VT um, in the R1. So uh, that's telling us that we need 50% of our sulfur needs to come on the backside from those reproductive into grain fill stages and the physiological maturity. Um, as far as zinc goes, we can kind of see a similar trend. About 50% of our zinc needs are taking place at VT to R1. The other 50% are basically utilized during grain fill. Diving in the data here a little bit, um, Bradford plot, we carried a 255 bushel average um, on this plot, 13.1 bushel LSD. Phosphorus levels here were trending pretty good. Right there in that main range, 65 pounds, pH levels were good. Um, sulfur levels were trending low at this location. Zinc levels were kind of in that average to medium range. Um, basically what we saw in this plot is we do see a statistical advantage to our MES treatment over our check. Um, but we've got that 13 bushel LSD there, so our MES and our MAC treatments are statistically similar. So, um, kind of a wash between those two treatments. Uh, Milford Center plot, 202 average, 7.9 bushel LSD. Phosphorus levels were trending low here, so we've got a 33 pound gray P1 level. Um, so we're below critical level on our phosphorus at this location. Um, sulfur, once again, trending low, zinc in that average range. Um, as we can see in the data, we do see a statistical advantage to both the MES and the MAP treatment over the check. Um, no statistical difference between the MES and the MAP per se, but uh, we do see responses to both dry products over our check at this plot location. Troy plot, 203 average, 20.3 bushel LSD. Phosphorus levels here, once again, kind of in that maintenance range of 57 pounds. Um, pH levels were low. Sulfur levels were low at this plot as well, so we've got a reoccurring trend going on here with our spring soil test sulfur levels really trending low at all of our locations so far. Um, as far as the data goes, we basically have statistical, um, no statistical differences between any of the treatments at this location. <laughs> our last plot, uh, Washington Courthouse, 192 average, 17 bushel LSD. <coughs> Once again, phosphorus levels in that maintenance range. Sulfur levels trending low again, zinc levels average. Um, we actually see in this location a statistical advantage to the check over both our MAP and our MES, which is a little bit backwards from what we'd anticipate, but uh, I'll take you through this next chart real quick. Uh, once again, I indicate at the beginning, this is a replicated randomized design. What we've got at the bottom of our graph here is plot number 101 on the left, plot number 115 at the right. Um, the green line indicates our check treatment, the red lines are map, blue lines are mes. Um, basically the summary of this is, if you look at the outsides of the plot, we can see where the yield really dives off um, on those outsides. Basically we just have a lot more variability at this location um, versus our check kind of being pretty stagnant across the middle. So that's really why we're seeing the check um, outpacing both the map and the mes, just because of the variability we have on the outside of that plot at this individual. Looking at the data average together, um, MES, we are at 215.3, MAP, 213.5, our check treatment was at 211.3. So we've got about a four bushel spread here between MES and MAP, or between MES and check, excuse me, um, on all of our plot locations averaged out a little under a two bushel spread between the MES and the MAP treatment. <coughs> Looking at our return on investment, um, based off of current updated fertilizer pricing, a 200-pound rate of MES, we're looking at 52.20 an acre for application. Uh, MAP, 46.60, we've got a spread there at 5.60 at $4 corn. We need a 1.4 bushel break even to pay for that MES over just our standard MAP application. Um, once again, going back here, we're kind of teetering right in that, you know, 1.8 bushel um, response. So we're maybe just a fuzz over break even on all plots average. So uh, my thoughts here. Um, while the MES does look pretty good compared to our check, we still lack a, a lot of statistical responses compared to the MAP treatment at our individual locations. Um, 
all of our sulfur levels were trending low at all locations. So we're sitting here thinking, okay, we've got this mess with 20 pounds of sulfur out there. Why are we not seeing bigger responses out of our sulfur um, with that mess product versus that map that had no additional sulfur added? Um, could it be a timing issue? Once again, as I indicated earlier, we need 50% of that sulfur from VT through physiological maturity. Um, higher rainfall this year, maybe we had some of that sulfur flushing through the soil profile and just wasn't there during those later uh, reproductive and the green fill stages to get to that point. Um, this is really pretty simple, but our biggest response is to dry products are still shown when phosphorus is below critical level. At Milford Center, we saw pretty good responses to both products when we had P levels that were below critical. Um, our other plots where we had phosphorus levels that were in maintenance range, we really didn't see many responses to those applications versus our check. Uh, pretty much matches up with our current fertility recommendation and what we're seeing. Um, I get some guys that say, you know, I just want to pour some fertilizer out there and get fresh fertilizer out there in the spring for that crop. Well, this data set's kind of showing as long as you're above critical level, one of those phosphorus levels, you're not going to see huge economic responses to additional applications of phosphorus. Um, I still think sulfur management is going to continue to become more important in corn fertility. Um, it's just going to be a stand. If you're not implementing some kind of sulfur program now, um, it's something you really ought to consider doing because it's going to be standard management practice here going forward. Um, as far as zinc goes, zinc, once again, usually performs the best or see the most responses out of high pH levels, high phosphorus levels, low organic matter levels. We just didn't really have any of those scenarios based off our soil test data at these plots, so I really wouldn't anticipate seeing much of a response to a zinc program based off where these soil test levels were on these plots. Okay, soybean data. Uh, boron basics. So boron is an essential element needed by all plants. Um, typically, high soil pHs and low organic matter levels will affect availability. Carries a negative charge and is very, very mobile in the soil. Um, so boron's immobile in plants, and which means that it won't remobilize from old tissue to new tissue. Um, my opinion, that makes foliar applications of boron relatively worthless. Um, Basically what's going to happen is if you fully <coughs> apply a nutrient like that, you're going to get that nutrient bound up in those cell walls where that nutrient was applied. You're not able to get remobilization of that nutrient, so when you get new vegetative growth coming out, that boron is basically going to stay where it was. It won't remobilize to that newer growth. Um, so boron moves mainly through xylem transport with water from root uptake. Um, micronutrient, once again, need to be relatively small quantities of plants. And one big key with boron is excess applications can cause toxicity. Um, this is one of those nutrients that you really have to be careful of because if you're just out there feeding luxury amounts of boron, you can't see toxicity that can be detrimental. Um, Similar to the graph I showed here earlier, so if you look at boron, which would be in that top right-hand corner, um, we can see basically between V7 and R2 would kind of be that R1 growth stage. We're only utilizing about 15% of our total boron needs for that R1 or flowering. Um, the rest of our boron is utilized through reproduction into grain fill. So that's a lot of that nutrient that we need on the backside of that swimming. Uh, take a look at some of the data here. Bradford plot, 71.7 bushel average, 3.5 bushel LSD, um, low CEC plot of 9.8, 2.5% .8, organic matter. Uh, K levels were pretty decent at this plot for the low CECs, and we do have low boron levels at 0.3 ppm. Um, with all that being said, um, with the 3.5 bushel LSD, basically we're statistically similar on all on all of our treatments at this location. Milford Center plot, um, kind of the same thing, statistically similar on all of our on all of our treatments, 5.7 bushel LSD. Um, had pretty decent potassium numbers of 292 on 22 CEC. Boron levels were trending low at this plot again, um, but still lack of true statistical difference. Troy plot, 
um, kind of the same thing. We're on level still trending low. Um, actually, on all of our plots, I probably would have thought we would have got a statistical advantage to both the Aspire and Potash dislocation because we've got 211 pound K level here, which is pretty low. Um, and we really just weren't seeing much of a response to that, that spring applied application of this location. Um, courthouse plot we did, however, um, you, know, you look at this plot, we've got 20.9 CEC soil with a 374 pound potassium level. Um, and we are seeing responses to Aspire and Potash over our check, even with elevated K levels. Um, boron levels were trying to load this plot again. Looking at the averages, um, so we we're at 63.8 on Aspire, 63 on Potash, 62 and a half on the check. So um, really pretty tight um, overall between all those plots averaged out together. Looking at our ROI, 207 pound rate of Aspire, we're looking at 39.43. Uh, Potash 31.10, that's a difference of 8.33 an acre. So we need just a fuzz under a bushel of silk soybeans to pay for that Aspire, that basically getting that Soybean. Um, we go back here and look at our averages again. You know, it's, it's, we're basically just a fuzz below break even at best. Um, looking at this data set. So conclusions. Um, once again, our boron levels were trending low in all of our locations. Um, basically, 0.2 to 0.3 ppm on boron. Um, it's kind of surprising we didn't see more responses to those boron applications with those soil test levels trending that low. Um, but, you know, we did have a statistical response shown on Aspire and Potash against the, uh, the control at one location. I think we need to repeat this data. Um, at this time, based off this data, I'm not seeing a serious economic return running a product like Aspire versus a pop, regular Potash treatment. Um, that makes economic sense to me. Um, what could be influencing this, I think, is if we look at um, what I said earlier, boron is very mobile in the soil. We need about 85% of that from R1 um, through physiological maturity. We had a pretty high rainfall season this year. Maybe we lost some of that boron even at planting that leached through the soil profile. Um, it just wasn't available, kind of like we talked about with sulfur. Um, when that, when that plant needed it. I think we want to repeat the study again next year, um, but maybe we need to look at playing around with some different timings and uh, maybe application rates. Just to summarize everything that I went through again, so um, MES applications are born basically running right at break even compared to our MAP treatment across our multiple locations. Um, Aspire treatments were slightly below break even compared to potash. Once again, I'd like to repeat this study, um, especially on the soybean side of things. Maybe what we need to do is look at pushing that boron or that Aspire application back to more of an in-season application, um, which is a little bit different thinking, um, versus having that out, out there up front. So um, just a thought I've been toying around with. Uh, I want to give recognition to Mosaic for their participation in this pro uh, project that we did here this last season. And if anybody's got any questions, I'd be happy to have about a minute or two to field any questions. Did the corn control have MAP on in the fall then? So what the, the corn control, so what it did have is it had um, 150 pounds of triple 12 put down with the planer. Um, is, is the application that was made on, on the, <clears throat> so even the control did have a little bit of phosphorus going down. Anybody else? Gabe, you got anything? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Was there any other supplementary sulfur or zinc put on with the check at all, like a side press time? No, so the side dress is basically just a standard 28 application. No supplemental sulfur or zinc went down on the control. Um, so basically only, only sulfur and zinc that was applied on these plots would have been sulfur and zinc that was supplied out of the mess itself. If there's no other questions, that's all I've got. Thank you.